Our kind Heavenly Father, we want to thank you from the very depths of our heart for all that thou hast done for us. We're unworthy of the blessings that thou hast bestowed upon us, but we are grateful for them. And now we pray that you will smile your blessings continually upon us, and especially tonight, as we have just remembered that tonight is tonight we are to pray for the great host of people. Give us great faith. May great wonders be done for the glory of God. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I have just remembered <clears throat> that tonight was the night we were to pray for all the people and you forgot to tell me that he's coming down and give prayer cards for all those people who just wanted to pass through the line. And I forgot about it because just here at the platform that we were to do that. And uh, it hasn't come in my memory, rather, since coming from the place. So I thought I'd change my text then and talk on something else. But I was going to talk on something, but I'll change it now. And we want to thank all you ministers for this morning attending the breakfast. We just had a real jubilee this morning. The Lord blessed in a marvelous way. And the wonderful fellowship that we had with God's children this morning. And now, tonight, I believe the recording boys this will be the last night for the books and the pictures. They'll be at the concession stand, wherever it is. We don't sell on Sunday. <clears throat> I've never did it. And I, uh, the, the books and those things are not nothing that we make anything from. I buy them myself for Mr. Lindsay. And then I'll get somebody to sell them for me. And the meeting has to support the books. <laughs> Now, they, you, now, if I was printing them myself and sell them, or I could get them printed real cheap and sell them. But it's not, that isn't the idea. It's not to make anything out of them. No. It's the, getting the message to the people. And so you can be invited, if you're planning on getting one of the books or pictures, if you get it tonight. Then tomorrow afternoon, there is to be the service here in the place, the Lord willing. And then tomorrow night closes out this campaign. I know that there's other campaigns coming to the city as Phoenix seems to have plenty of them, and that's good. I'm glad to do. I was just speaking to a minister just a few moments ago, and a well-known minister here in the city, he said, Brother Branham, the Phoenix people love you. And I said, that certainly is mutual. I wish I had time when I come into this city to go to each one of your homes and have dinner. I know you've got good cooks, and I, I would sure like to do it, but it's seemingly that in these meetings I've just got to constantly stay on the beat until I just get so wore out I can't go. Brother Moore, I was trying to get him to preach for me, but I'll tell you, if you preach, you fall over on the platform, then we get a doctor, and he says, really, you're in bad shape. So I'll try it next time. I said, now, Brother Moore. But we're happy to be assembled with you tonight. And now, even in our, in our day that we're living in, and this morning I was speaking at the breakfast on the subject of Joel, were the one where he saw the worms, different insects, eat down the tree. God's heritage. And we tried to name what those worms was. And how that each one of those worms is the same worm, just dies and comes back a different insect. And it's been the devil all the way along. Who broke up brotherhood and the things that they had in the first church and the false unity of the church while we try to unify people with organizations. Organization unifies themselves. But Christ 
died for the whole body of See, it's not just a unity amongst one organization, it's a unity amongst the entire body of Christ. And those old worms are just, every time that, that this little tree that's been cut down, and it's laying there just as a stump, and every time some life starts up, the first thing you know, we build a little organization around it, the worms get in and eat it down. I said, one of these days, God's going to bring down some insect powder. He's going to spray these worms. <laughs> They'll quit eating <laughs> from that time on. When a man can be so isolated from those things by the love of God and the Holy Ghost, it'll never touch him. <clears throat> we had people who sound that place. I know a man that wouldn't make any difference what organization you belong to or what you believe. You're a brother anyhow. They wouldn't draw any line. That, if it can work on one or two, it can work on the rest of us, that's right. We can all be the same. You know, I was thinking over in Job, the 14th chapter. It said there's hope in a tree if it dies. And the, even the stalk grows old, the roots of the ground. Through the scent of rain, water, it will bring forth brows again. Now, that gospel stump that's in the ground, the Pentecostal blessing, the only thing it needs is some Pentecostal water. And Pentecostal water is the Word. Well, we are washed by the water, by the Word. And just some good old-fashioned Holy Ghost gospel teaching will certainly put that thing right back in its place and bring it out again. That's right. Now, I told Brother Moore this afternoon, if I preach longer tonight than 20 or 30 minutes, for him to stick me in the back. And so, I just, when I come to talk, I'm a long way from being a preacher, a theologian. But what I know about Jesus, I love to tell others. And I just put everything that there is in me in it, because it's my large work. And if I was doing a job for you out here busting concrete, I'd do the best job I could do. How much more doing for the Lord? I want to do my best when I walk to this platform, do everything that lays within me to win the souls to Christ. Because I know, and you know, we haven't got too much longer to do this. Now. Being that we're going to have uh, the type of meeting that we will tonight, I'd like to encourage faith. People passing through the line like that, they must have faith. So I want to read uh, just a verse out of the 14th verse of the 22nd chapter of Genesis. And Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said, to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. <clears throat> God in the Old Testament had seven compound redemptive names. And when this picture was taken that you see out there of the pillar of fire, as I regard it that way, and the night that it was taken is when Brother Bosworth asked the Baptist preacher in a debate in Houston, Texas, this question. He said, if you will answer me this one question, yes or no, I'll walk off the platform. He said, was the redemptive names of Jehovah applied to Jesus, yes or no? That settled it. If the redemptive names of Jehovah was not applied to Jesus, he was not Jehovah Jireh or Jehovah Rabbi, the Lord or Jehovah Jireh, the Lord's provided sacrifice, and if he was Jehovah Jireh, he's Jehovah Rabbi also, the Lord that heals all our diseases. They're inseparable. Just like you can't separate them. You can't separate God from His nature and His motive. And if He is Jehovah Jireh tonight, the Lord will provide a sacrifice. If He wasn't that, 
then he wasn't the Lord's sacrifice and he wasn't the Savior. And if he is Jehovah Jireh, he's also Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that healed all our diseases. That settles it. There's no way of answering it. Just say it's yes or no. To deny it is to deny Christ being the Savior. To accept it is to accept him as your healer. So there's no other way out of it. And I'm so glad of that. Now, we're going to speak tonight on this one compound redemptive thing, Jehovah Jireh. And now to get a background of our story, everything, you must not take just one little scripture to prove anything. It must lay out in the whole view of the Bible. That's the way we want to do it. The subject must run completely from Genesis to Revelation. It must tie right in with the rest of the Bible in the right place. And Abraham will have to go back before we get this sacrifice. We'll have to go back and find out who Abraham was. And I truly believe that the Spirit of God that was in Abraham was a part of Christ. I believe that the, the part of the Holy Spirit that we have today is a part of Christ. Being that I said what I did this morning, I would like to explain this. What is these great gifts and things? Christ was in Joseph. Do you believe that? Look, I was sold for 30 pieces of silver, almost 30, and was hated of his brothers, loved of his father, just exactly like Christ. And how that they hated him because he was spiritual, could see visions and interpret dreams. Spiritual, just like Christ. He was thrown in a ditch, supposedly he'd be dead, just like Christ. He was raised up from the ditch, and set at the right hand of Pharaoh. And when Joseph went forth, they blowed trumpets and said, Bow the knee to Joseph. He could find Pharaoh's princes at his own pleasure. And no man could come to Pharaoh only through Joseph. Perfect picture of Christ. When David was dethroned out of Jerusalem and was drove up on the Mount of Olives, by his own people, his own children. As David went up the mountain, he looked back over Jerusalem weeping. Eight hundred years later, the son of David, rejected in Jerusalem, sat on the Mount of Olives and said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how oft would I have gathered you as a hen does her brood? It was the Spirit of God in those men. Now, God is like a great big diamond. And that diamond has been chipped or cut in such a way a true cut diamond reflects many rays of light. And when we see in the church the many different gifts of the Spirit, it is only the reflection of, of the real diamond. And one may seem a little peculiar to the other, but it's the way the diamond reflects the light. So God does that also in the way that he reflects a gift of the Bible. One has the gift of knowledge, the other has the gift of tongues, and the other has the gift of something else. It's God reflecting these lights. And they are lights that gathered in one person, that's Almighty God. Now, Abraham was a part of God. Jesus said when he was sure on earth, Is not it written in your laws that ye are gods? And if they call those gods to who the word of God come to, how about him being God? They were gods by measure. He was the fullness of God. God was in him, reconciling the world to himself. Now, Abraham... Let's take just a little look at his life. Who was he? Where did he come from? 
Was he a special born child? A seventh son of the seventh son? No, sir. He was just an ordinary man. He come from his father down from Babylon and perhaps was raised around idolatry. But God by election chose Abraham. Not because that he was a good man, but because God elected Abraham. And that's the only way that you'll ever come to God. It's God's election. God does the choosing. You have nothing to do with it. There's no man has sought God at any time. You can't seek God. It's God seeking you. It's something in you creating that desire. And that's the reason there's divine healing, if the Bible didn't even say so, is that creating something in the children of God that's hunting for that fountain that's open. But the strange thing, when you find through the fountain, like the disciples that night who was praying for help, and the very help that comes to them is afraid of it. Now, notice what God did. Now, Abraham in the Bible represents election, Isaac, justification, Jacob, grace, Joseph, perfection. Then it ran out. Perfection. Joseph was a perfect man. There's nothing against him in the Bible. But on this election, God chose Abraham, not because he was an educated man, not because he was a smart man, but because that God saw something in Abraham before the foundation of the world. And that's the reason you are a Christian tonight, is because that God saw something in you before the foundation of the world and put your name on the Lamb's Book of Life before the world ever was formed. How are you going to lose? How can you do it? The Bible says the biggest fault that I can find with any of the churches, and especially the real church that's born again, they don't know who they are. You don't realize what the privilege that God has given you. You're looking for something way off in some kind of a millennium. But that's one the devil has pulled over you. Now we are the sons of God. Not we will be, we are now. And every redemptive blessing that the Lord Jesus died for is our personal property right now. Everything that he died for. Not he will be, we are now. Now let's watch Abraham and see what a promise God gave Abraham. God gave Abraham the promise and made the covenant with him unconditionally. Not if you'll do this, if you'll do that, he had nothing to do with it. God said, I've already saved you, you're going to come to me in old age. That settles it. When man makes covenant with God, man breaks his covenant. When man and God had covenant together in the Garden of Eden, man broke his covenant. Then he made a covenant with him through the law, man wouldn't even keep it. But God was determined to save man. So he gave the covenant to Abraham and his seed. Abraham and his seed unconditionally. Not because you do this and because you do that or because you have this or have that, but God made the covenant unconditionally. That's what the Bible says. Now you say, well, I wish I was a Jew. Well, that which is outwardly is not a Jew. But that which is inwardly, says the Bible. And we being dead in Christ, the Bible says that we take on Abraham's seed. 
And we are heirs with him. According to the promise. Every man that has been filled with the Holy Ghost. Has the seed of Abraham in him. Because he has the faith of Abraham in him. And Abraham believed God before circumcision or anything else. And it was imputed unto him for righteousness. You see it? That takes the scare out of you. It's not, oh, if I can just keep hanging on. Oh, that is the idea. I never did try to hang on. He done the hanging on, and by grace he saved me. It ain't what I do, it's what he done. What I do doesn't matter anything. It's what he's done for me. Now, if I love him, I will do everything that's in my power to do the right thing for him. Now, if a man says, well, I just, I just Presbyterian idea. I just walk up and shake hands and say, I got it. That's all right. I got eternal security. Brother, you're off the track. My wife, I love her. I made a covenant with her to be her husband. And if I was away from home and some woman would come to me and say, I love you. And I wanted, felt like that I would make love to the woman and then he would forgive me for it when I went home. I still wouldn't do it. Though I know she'd forgive me, I wouldn't hurt her like that. And a man that loves God, you don't quit drinking, smoking just because you think you're going to keep you from going to hell. If you love the Lord, you do it because you don't want to hurt him. I've seen fashion, cults, and deep seats of people to wear the ladies to wear long dresses, long sleeves, and long hair. That's all right. They should. But that isn't what takes you to heaven. You could have your hair long, your dresses long, and have a temper enough to fight a bus so, and hate your neighbor and everything else. But the reason that you do keep yourself the way it should be is because you love the Lord and want to keep His commandments. If you're Abraham's daughter, you're Abraham's son, that's what does it. Now, Abraham believed God when God met him and talked to him and said, Now, Abraham, I've called you. I'm making my covenant with you. And I'm going to give you a son. Now, Abraham was 75 years old. And Sarah was 65 years old. And he married her when she was just a little girl because she was his half-sister. Now they lived together since they were little ones. Been husband and wife all through the healthy days of Sarah. She's 65 years old. About 25 years, a better past the menopause, and it was impossible for her to have that baby. But yet, God asked Abraham to believe the impossible. And He asked you, the seed of Abraham, to believe the impossible. Because his word is a creative thing. Abraham just held on to God's word. He believed God. That's all he had to do. Now he didn't look at how uh, impossible it was. He just accepted and took God at his word and went to rejoicing over it. God loved that. Now, Abraham didn't say, now, wait a minute, Lord. When I begin to see something happen, when I begin to see and know by all signs of nature that we're going to have this baby, then I'm going to tell the people about it. But you couldn't expect me to go down and tell the doctor and get everything ready we're going to have a baby. He'd laugh at me. I'm 75 years old and she's 65. What do you think would happen today if an old man and woman 65 and 75 would walk into the doctor's office and say, Doctor, we want to make arrangements for the baby. 
the doctor would say, say, is this your wife? Yes, I like to examine her. Why, it's impossible. Did nature come just according to the time? Yes. Well, it's impossible for her to have it. Then you'd say, well, doc, I suppose you're right. And go on back, it wouldn't happen. But Abraham didn't look at what the doctor said. Abraham looked at what God said. And Abraham's seed does the same thing. They don't look at what science says. They look at what God says. Oh, I'm so glad that he still has seed in the earth. They look at what God says. They take God's word for it. Now, could you imagine Sarah going down to the finest shop that she could find, an old woman, 65 years old, with a little grandma shawl over her head, going down to the shop buying bird iron pins and everything, getting ready? You'd imagine what the people would say. That old lady's gone off at the deep end. But you know why? She had God's word for her. Could you imagine Abraham going around testifying to everybody? Glory to God, we're going to have a baby now. I can imagine seeing the fellow says, poor old man. See, every time that anyone takes God at his word, is considered a fanatic. And God asks you to believe for the impossible because He is able to do that which is impossible. Abraham staggered not the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong giving praise unto God. God wants you to do the miraculous he wants you to believe the miraculous, and by accepting it by faith, you prove what you believe He is. You see, God wants you to take His word for it. He speaks it, and if God has said it, all heavens and earth will pass away, but that word can't pass. Now, another thing God does. He told Abraham and Sarah to separate themselves from the company. God calls for separation. How much different is than us choosing anything? We, chose, we choose mixers. <laughs> oh, yes. I tell you, that's the socialist little fellow you ever seen. Now, he's not a fanatic. He won't preach anything against television and all this kind of stuff like that, about women wearing bobbed hair and all these things like that. You never hear spoke in our church just because he hasn't got the real audacity, he hasn't got the baptism of the Holy Ghost to back it up. So, what we need is God-fearing preachers who tell us the truth. That's right. Now, that's what makes the separation. If I was choosing a pastor and I was on the board and I had to select a pastor, he is one of those wishy-washy kind of sissy five guys like that. I sure wouldn't vote him into my church. Uh, anything I'd vote him out and get a man that did believe God's Word and took God's Word and preached it and stood on it. I want a son of Abraham up there, a son of God. Now, notice, Abraham had to separate himself. And as long as his kinfolks hanged around with him and he didn't do what God told him to do, the blessing never was made manifest. And as long as you keep holding on to a little petty something, a little something here, a little something there, God can never fully bless you. As long as you try to take God for a totem pole. You know, Brother Roberts is down. Hallelujah. I had him not to pray for me. Glory to God. If it don't work, a Paul King comes through. Hallelujah. I'll give him a round. Right here, Brother Branham comes. I'll let him give me a round, too. And see how it come out. You'll just be the same old guy with the same old disease. When every one of them do because there's nothing good in any of us. But when you forget about preachers and personalities and look to the Lord Jesus Christ, then you're going to get somewhere. Take God at His Word. See? It's God's Word that's creating you. God's Word is a seed. And a seed sown and taken care of 
if it's germatized and a good seed, it'll bear the kind of fruit it is. So if you need healing, ask him, here's a promise, and here every promise is yours. Now, we find out then a little later on, as you begin to move on, then there comes a separation time that he had to separate himself from his kindred. His father died as long as the old man was long. He never did bless him. But after all was separated, God appeared to him. Lot had took his choice, went out into Sodom. As long as Lot hung along, there's arguments. And as long as you stick around with unbelievers, you'll find the same trouble. But when Abraham was ninety and nine years old, ninety-nine, that made Sarah eighty-eight. Could you imagine Abraham? Could you imagine when Abraham went and told Sarah's wife, saying, sweetheart, you know we've always longed to have children. Oh, yes, Abraham. Well, bless God, we're going to have a baby. Why, Sarah said, Abraham. Uh, I, I don't understand. Neither do I. Well, how do you know we're going to have a baby? God said so. That settles it. God said so. He's going to do it. Well, the, after the first few days, well, maybe the first month, why well, he comes to Sarah and he said, Sarah, how are you feeling, honey? Not a bit of difference. Abraham, are you sure? He said, glory to God, we're going to have it anyhow. Good. How do you know, Abraham? God said so. The second month passed. Tell her how you feel. Anything happens, not a bit of difference. Glory to God, we're going to have it anyhow. How do you know? God said so. The first year passed. Sarah, you still have got all those diapers and things ready? Yes. Have you felt any difference? Not a bit. But hallelujah, we're going to have it anyhow. God said so. Keep my thoughts in them. They'll be all right. All right. When 25 years passed. 25 years passed. Tell her how you feel. No different. Glory to God, we're going to have it anyhow. There you are. He didn't look at circumstances. He looked at what God said. He was looking at the Word. You were some time ago went in to pray for a boy that had diphtheria. And he's choking, he's choking to death. The old daddy come over with the mother. Knowing that boy, at first he wouldn't let me go in. And the doctor there, the head doctor, was, I learned, was Catholic. And I said, well, you let the priest go in. He said, that's different. You're married men got children. I said, I mean just as much to that boy as the priest would mean to a Catholic boy. I said, the father here has sent for me to come pray for the boy. He said, but you got children, Reverend. I said, I know that, but I've got a Savior, too. He said, do you know that you could pack the disease to your child? I said, Doctor, I appreciate your ethics and all that you do. But there's one thing you don't understand. I said, my God can shield me from that. He's done it many times through leprosy and everything else. I take his word for it. And when we went in, he dressed me up like a club clan. And when we went in there and knelt down to pray for the boy, just with all your little prayer, got up. The mother was on one side, the dad was on the next side. The boy had been unconscious for two days. And his heart went so low to the cartogram showed. I forget what it was. I don't understand the machinery of it. But the nurse said it would never rise again. It couldn't. Never had been known to rise. His heart beat. And then when they got through praying, just a little prayer, got up. The old father reached across to the mother and he said, Mother, isn't this wonderful? But, oh, praise God for healing our boy. The boy was still unconscious. I looked at him and honest, my heart admired him. And the mother said, yes, Dad, that's just wonderful. How we thank the Lord. And the old brother put his hands up in the air and said, oh, God, how I thank you for healing my boy. Boy, laying her down. And the little nurse standing there and she walked over to him and she said, Sir, I don't understand. But how can you take that so lightly when your boy is dying? Oh, he said, he's not dying. But he's living and going to be well. 
Oh, she said, I can appreciate your faith. And she said, but there's one thing you must understand, sir. This machine is scientific. And if that hand went way down here, it can never come back again. It never has, and it never will. The old patriarch put his arm around the little lady, and he said, Look, little lady, see, you're looking to that machine, for that's what you've been trained to look at. That's all you know about. But that I'm looking to a divine promise of God that he'll raise him up. The boy's married now and got a family. What? It depends on what you look at. If God made the promise, God obligated to keep that promise. No matter what the circumstances is. Then God told Abraham, he appeared to him, in the name of El Shaddai, the bosom. And he said, Abraham, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be perfect. And he had, he said, I am the El Shaddai, the breasted God. The El Shaddai means breast like the woman. No, not breast, but breasted. I am the breasted God. I am the strength giver. Like a little baby when it's sick and threatened, crying, kicking, squalling, and the mother picks it up. And she leans it on her bosom, and it begins to nurse the mother's strength. And as the little fellow starts nursing, the first little taste of strength, he quits crying, and Mama just packs him a little, and he's satisfied while he's a nursing, he doesn't fret anymore, and he's bringing in his strength all the time. Well, that's what God is to the believer. He is the breasted God. He was wounded for our transgressions. With his stripes we were healed. And the believer lays right a hold of the breast of God, the Word of God, the New and Old Testament, and he lays right a hold of that divine promise and nurses and blesses God and pulls on the believer on his belief from God till he nurses back his strength again. And he's satisfied all the time he's nursing. Oh, my, I like that. He don't notice how... Did I go an inch a while ago? He don't pay attention when he go to an inch and He's just nursing. That's where a believer is. If it's explained to them by the Bible that he heals the sick, the believer just takes his word for it and that settles it. That's all. He don't say, am I any better? Can I move my finger a little more? Can I twist my toe? That don't have one thing to do with it. Not one thing. It's what happened in here. It ain't what's happened out here. It's what's happened here in the heart. Man believes God from the heart. And as long as that divine promise can find an anchoring place in the human heart, there is no devils in hell to be carried away from it. It's there. He believes it. He is in by it. Or he believes it. And holding that promise, as well as keep holding it, believing it, the finger begins to wiggle. Then the hand begins to move. See, he's nursing the strength of God into his own body. And then God told Abraham, he said, now that you're separated from what? He took the bad choice. All the fields was watered down in Sodom. Big cities were built full of sin. And isn't it strange that that lukewarm believer lot would go down to the best place he could find, the most beautiful place he could find, take the road of ease? And isn't it a strange thing that sometimes people who say that they plead God they want to take the road of luxury. They want to take the road where there's no trial. They want to take the easiest way out. They want to take the way that's not persecuted. They want to take the road of ease. 
It's just a leap one believer. But Abraham, the man of God, gave Lot his choice and taken what was left. Oh, I just love that. A real believer will give you your choice. He's willing to take what's left. There's no selfishness in a real believer. Not at all. Now notice again. After God had separated and taken his place, God appeared to Abraham. He said, Abraham, rise up. Look all around. Look to the east. Look to the west, to the north, and to the south. He said, every bit of it belongs to you. It's all yours. I'll give it to you. It's yours. Well, Abraham is going to fall heir to all of it. So he said, get up and walk around through the land and see what you do. I think God calls the children of Abraham to do that. If this little group of people gathered here tonight would only get up, if the people in Phoenix alone would only search out through the world what you have, you possess all things. All things were given to us by Jesus Christ. If we're believers, you know, if I bought a home, and if it's mine, I go through the things, see what I have. I'm just kind of a prospector. I like to dig around, find out what I got. I'm an heir of salvation. I'm an heir of divine healing. I'm an heir of heaven. I'm an heir to the earth. I'm an heir and joint heir with Christ in all things. Then I like to look through this book of prospect and see what all I'm an heir to. You know, it's just like a great big arcade. A great big place. A they told me I own that arcade. I like to go and see what I have. I like to pull out this drawer and look in it and see what I got in there. I like to go here and open this place up and see what I got in there. I like to go somewhere else and look. If some place looks just a little bit high, I'll just get this step ladder. Walk that up and pull it down and look at it. See what it belongs to me. It's all mine. Well, that's what it is in a Bible. If anything looks too far away, too big, too high, just get out on your knees. That's your step ladder. Lord, let me understand it. Just keep moving right up till you touch it. Look at all those bones to you. It's all yours. It's for every believer. Some time ago, I was talking to a man named John Sproul. He's a good friend of mine. He spoke to the country many years ago with the old glory barn. I don't know if he's ever out here or not. Went to the eastern country, and a lot of you eastern people will remember John Sproul. And he was one of Brother Bob's worst converts. He was healed with a bad throat, where he got gas with him. Mustard gas sucked into his nose or throat and burned it. He didn't have no voice at all, and Brother Bob's was prayed for him. He got healed. Called his wife up, and she fainted. And he went out, and the sick, and prayed for him. Took a little vacation and went over to France. He went out to La Salle Lorraine, France. He was going through a great garden and he found a statue of the Lord Jesus. And he was standing there with his wife, he said, in amazement. Then look at that. What did the sculpture mean? Why the thing doesn't have nothing but just it's the shape. There can't be no suffering of Christ then. And the guy come up to him and said, Mr. Spurl. I suppose you're criticizing that. He said, I am. He said, I'll come here just a moment. And he took him up, and there was an altar built there beneath the, the statue. And so he said, kneel down. And he knelt down, said, now look up. Oh, he said, felt like his heart would just break. There was every suffering of Christ. There was every agony that he went through. Looked like the sculpture had reproduced that in the features of his face. And so he turned and looked again to the, to the guy. He said, Mr. Spool, said, you see, the sculpture had in mind one thing. Said that when he made this statue, he didn't make it for people to stand off and look at it this way. He made it so that people bow down and look up to it this way. 
That's the same word it is with every promise in the Bible. It isn't for you to try to mix it with your word and wisdom to try to figure out how could God do this? How could God do that? The Bible wasn't written for that. The Bible's promises were written for you to bow down and look up to. Then they look different to you. When you look up to them like that, God kept his promise with Abraham. He gave him a child. And the little boy, when he was born, rose to about 12, 14 years old. And you know how that must have been a lovely thing in that family. Now, a mother of about 110, 15, a father of about 125 or 30. If we had time, I might have preached on it once before. How God turned it back to a young man and a woman, and I've had it in magazines and so forth. And made them over again, which you'll do every born again child of Abraham someday in the resurrection. And then one day God wanted to make it real plain to the people in Phoenix. So how he was going to do it, he was going to give this Abraham a double test. So he said, Abraham, take thine son, thy only son. And take him to a certain mountain where I'm going to show you, and there sacrifice him. Now, what if Abraham would have took the second thought? How am I going to be the father of a nation when you am this old and you're asking me to kill and destroy the only evidence that I have that you'll keep your word to make me a father of a nation? How God loves to test His people. Every child that comes to God must be tested. Child true. No exceptions. Everyone. And maybe tonight that you are sick just to have a little child true. Just a little testing. Don't be discouraged. God's on the throne. He knows all things. If we're truly born to the Spirit of God, everything's working together for our good. He's going to make everything right. He promised He would. He swore He would. And He's got to keep that word. He's kept it now for thousands of years. To every believer, would you be any exception? No, sir. You're no exception. Now watch Him now. Watch how this beautiful act takes place. Now, Abraham did not want to tell Sarah about this. As their only little curly-headed boy of about 12 years old, how hard it would be to take that little fellow out and tell Sarah. The mother just didn't understand. How am I going to tell her to take this little boy out and go to kill him? Why, she wouldn't understand it. And there's many times we have to go ahead and do things and preach things that we really don't want to do it, but we just don't understand it. But God's working everything just right. See, it's all for the good. Sometimes you can't tell your congregation. You can't tell the public. You can't tell your own church why. But you've got to do it anyhow. Now notice, one morning he gets up, chops some wood, and puts it on a little mule, calls a couple of servants, and got the little boy up, said, we're going out to worship. And they went three days' journey. Now, I can walk any time 25 to 30 miles a day. And I drive a lot in a car. I, have, I patrol for seven years, averaging 26 to 28 miles a day through wilderness. And those people then can walk better than we can now. But we're used to riding and so forth. But now, if you walk three days at 25 miles a day, he was 75 miles back from civilization. And then he lifted up his eyes and saw the mount way off where God had shown him in a vision. And so when he got to the hill, I just love this part, he said to the service, you stay here, the boy and I are going yonder to worship. And he and I will return. Did you get it? The boy and I will return. How are you going 
to do it, Abraham. Explain to me. If you've got the knife in the sheath here and a vision from God telling you to go kill that boy, how are you two going to return back? But God believed Abraham. Or Abraham believed God. He didn't take no second thought. The only thing he knows, God gave the promise. And if Abraham had received Isaac as one from the dead, he knew that God could raise him up from the dead again. And if you being dead in sin and trespasses, without any nature to serve God at all, and God by election called you and gave you his spirit, without you making any choice, no man can come to me except my father draws him first. And if God did that to you without you being able to make a choice, how much more will he heal you and keep you when you've got a choice by a sworn effort of his? What a marvelous thing. How did God promise? Abraham didn't take the second thought. He said, well, God's been good. He kept his promise. I don't know how he's going to do it, but he'll do it. I can't tell you how God does it. How that he could heal a man that's dying with cancer and the doctors has given him up and he's eat to pieces. But if it would be necessary, I believe tonight I could produce 500 cases of it. Sure. Today as I was going into the restaurant to eat the breakfast, a little man standing behind me. And he said, do you remember me? I didn't. But somebody had told me that that man was brought to the meeting with TB so bad that he couldn't even whisper. And I believe he's one of the sponsoring pastors tonight. Or he's a minister of the gospel, preached with a voice like a roaring lion. How can God do that? I can't explain it, but God said he'd do it. That settles it. You take his word. You don't try to figure it out. You can't figure it out. I've seen so many times that people say, well, I've got to figure it out. i got to, I got to understand it. But it isn't a faith anymore. Faith is not what you understand. Faith is what you accept and can't explain it. It's an act of faith. Now, when he took the boy, the fire and the wood, and went up the hill, little Isaac got cured. If you see, it's a perfect picture of God leading his son up Mount Calvary. Certainly is. The father and the son, the only begotten. It's a perfect picture. And when they get up to the top of the mountain, little Isaac said, Father, said, here is the altar, here's the wood, here's the fire, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? He couldn't understand. Look at Abraham and not a quiver in his voice. He said, My son, God will provide for himself a lamb for the sacrifice. Didn't know yet what was going to take place. He was stepping right up like the Hebrew children, right up to the fire furnace. We are God's able to deliver us, but nevertheless, we won't bow to your image. So when he got there, he took little Isaac, put his hands behind him, tied him, tied his feet, laid him up on the altar, pulled back his little hair away from his face, could you imagine the feeling of a father pulled a knife out of the sheath? Little Isaac never squealed. He never made an offer. He was trusting his father. Oh, how those real dark hours can come. Yet a real believer will trust his father. You're trusting. Like Job said, so he slay me, yet I trust him. And when he drew the knife to slice the throat of his own son, Raised it up in his hand, no doubt a little tear come down from the beard across his face. But as he raised up the slice the throat of his own son, about that time something caught his hand. And the Holy Spirit spoke from the heavens and said, Abraham, stay your hand. And about that time, a, a little ram bladed behind him. A ram, a male sheep. 
had got his corns hooked in the weed and the vine. And Abraham loosed his son right quick, went over and picked up this lamb, ram, and laid him up on the altar and killed the ram in the place of his son. I want to ask you something. Seriously now. Where did that ram come from? Think of it. Practically 75 to 100 miles away from civilization, wolves and lions and everything else in the country. And besides that, he was up on top of a mountain where there's no water. And the ram could not have existed there. And why didn't Abraham see the ram when he was picking up the stones all around him to make the altar? It wasn't there. It was impossible for it to be there. It would have been, if a ram would have stayed that far away, it would have been killed. It wouldn't have been up on top of the mountain because you know yourself, sheep don't stay up there. Sheep stays in the meadows. The brush. But here was this ram up there. Where did it come from? God created it. And that's the reason Abraham called the place Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide the sacrifice. Now he didn't see a vision. A vision doesn't produce blood. The ram had a purple body. And it had literal corporal blood. And he killed the ram and offered the ram instead of his son. Why was it? Abraham was taking God at his word come to the end. And God is able to do the same thing here tonight to the seed of Abraham. So will take him at his word. No matter how sick you are, what's your condition? If you just step right up and take God at His word, God will provide. You say, I have no blood. I'm anemic. God can provide blood for you. You say, I my tissues are eat up with leukemia. How about the little boy I was on the platform the other night? I was just told tonight the little boy was taken back to his doctor and he was pronounced absolutely negative. The same doctor that examined him before. What happened? To Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide, and men and women will provide the faith. God will provide the substance. For faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Oh, seed of Abraham, don't you believe that He will provide for you tonight? And besides that, my brother, sister, he has already provided the lamb. And it's already made. The only thing you have to have is faith in his word. Let us pray. Our dear blessed Father, as our hearts beat beneath our shirts tonight, to the skin of our bodies, we just can't express what we think about you. How we are living in this great, marvelous day. We think in our lesson tonight that we didn't have a chance to get to. How do you tell Abraham, look at the sands of the sea? Can you number them? No. Neither will your seed be numbered. Then he said, look up to the stars. Can they be numbered? No. Neither will your seed to be numbered. I'm thanking God. What was it? From the dust to the stars. The seeds of Abraham. In the same promise, the same covenant. Someday you'll speak the word. And ever a seed of Abraham that's in the dust of the earth shall shine like the stars forever. We thank thee because thou hast by grace given us this 
unconditional covenant that is called us by thy own dear Son, the Lord Jesus, and give us eternal life that believe on him. And now, Father, tonight, I pray that these words go scattered through a tired, weary throat, that you will let them go because of the motives that I had behind to speak your word. It was to create faith among the people. And we're going to call these children of Abraham up to this platform to pray for them. Oh, blessed God, will you meet them here as they fulfill everything that is promised? Give them the faith, for it is written in the Bible by the Lord Jesus' own word, if they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. That's the promise. Let the children believe it, Lord. Oh, we know they will if they are the children of Abraham. They will take God at his word and call those things which are not as though they were. May it be said, Lord, that the night will be the great night when the great six lines will be lined up here that every one of them may be healed. And accept the Lord Jesus as a healer, for we ask it in his name. Amen. I'm very sorry to be so hoarse and kept as long as I did, but you were very nice to sit and wait. Thank you very kindly. And I say to you, I love you also, and every one of you. And I pray now that each one of these people here, visitors, there are just fine churches in this city. The pastors here, I don't think there's room for them on the platform, but they're around here. You get with some of these pastors now and find you a good church to go to in the morning. Go to Sunday school tomorrow and stay for church. They'll be glad to have you. Some of these good full gospel pastors here. They'll welcome you to their church. Then I think it falls right tomorrow afternoon for another service and then close out tomorrow night. I don't know when I can ever be back to Phoenix again. That I can't say. But I pray that I've longed before I come here. I've been here so many times I feel ashamed of myself. And I... I, before I come, I gave it very much consideration and prayer. And I thought, well, God, I know how those two sons are, this I do. And I said, but will you just do something special for me while I'm there this time? Let something happen, Lord, that'll do Phoenix a whole lot of good. Granny is what my prayer is. I don't know what it will be. I'm not asking God what it will be, but I'm just asking Him to do it. Something that will leave, parties leave behind us, footprints on the sands of time. Now, I believe I told Billy, told you all last night, that anybody that wanted to receive a card, not under the anointing, discernment, but just to come to the line to be prayed for, to be here tonight, and get your card. And I'll, you give them a, what, 50, I'm sorry, what, uh, F, all right, he gave out prayer cards F to those people, F, 1 to 50, and now, I'm sorry, 50 to 100, 50 to 100, F, 50 to 100, now we're going to try to pray for every one of them, and now, Let's see. Let's stand up. Who has F number one? Would you raise your hand if we could get them? Look at your prayer card. F number one. Oh, I'm sorry. All I'll try to take one. All right. F 50. Who has F 50? Raise up your hand. Prayer card F 50. All right, lady. Would you come here? 51. All right, lady. 
I wish you'd let them stand right off that way tonight if it's all right with you. Say so we're going to have to have someone or those guys in here, all right. Uh, 50, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 60, 61. Raise up your hands real quick. 61, 62, 63. I believe the little Mexican girl there raised up her hand. All right. 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, 71, 2, 72. F-72, I, I never seen the hand, I don't believe. F-72. Would you raise up your hand who has F-72? Oh, all right, lady. 73. 73, would you raise, 74, 75, 76, 77. 78, 79, 80, 81, 80, 81, did I see the 81? We don't want to miss anyone. 81, 82, 82, 83, 84, 84, Prayer card 84. Some of you help me to look at it. All right, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 92, 93, F93, do I see it, F93, Ninety-six, F ninety-six. Have I missed it? AF ninety-six. Yeah, all right. Ninety-seven, ninety-eight, ninety-eight, F ninety-eight, F ninety-eight, ninety-nine, one hundred. All right. <clears throat> now, this is the type of line that we used to have when we first come to Phoenix. How many here tonight was at my first meeting when I was in Phoenix? Well, my, my, just look. You remember when we come to prayer line, the people lay their hands over on mine? And I'd stand there just for a minute and hold her hand just a minute. And the Holy Spirit would reveal what was wrong. You remember that? Remember I said it would come to pass. The Lord told me tonight that he met me. That he would. It would come to pass if I be sincere. That he would take it to. I would know the very secrets of their hearts. I didn't man. But how I said it would come to pass that way if I be sincere. How many remember me saying that in the first meeting? See? Has it done it? That's right. See? Now he met me some time ago. Several months ago. And there's fixing to be a change in my ministry. It's a change for the better. There'll be a woman come on the platform one of these days. She'll be wearing a brown coat suit packing a baby. That'll be it. A little woman with a baby in her arm, with a little, I may say it wrong, it's a little skirt, 
In a little, is that what you call called? Uh, uh, Two-piece suit. Two-piece suit. I don't know much about ladies' clothes. Um, I can't even, I don't, never even bought my wife a pair of stockings uh, in my life. I, she can buy them herself, but I, I made a mistake on that one time. You know my life story. I was supposed to get one kind, I got another. So I just let them do it from now on. So they, I was going to buy my little girls one of those um, uh, little jumper jackets or whatever what the ladies wear, you know. The, oh, I don't know. Like the little ladies got there's got the uh, sitting there with the uh, rose on her. What do you call them things? Blouse. That's what it is. I was going to buy my little girl um, a blouse, and I had my daughter-in-law go do it. <laughs> I didn't couldn't do that. So have faith now. The Bible said, if there be one among you which is spiritual or prophet. I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him. Speak to him in dreams. Reveal myself in vision. And if what he says comes to pass, and hear him, for I'm with him. If it comes not to pass, then don't hear him, for I haven't spoken. Now I'm telling you from my heart, those visions that you see here at the platform, that's not me doing that. It's you doing that. You're the ones that are doing that. It's your faith anchored. I just submit myself. And as I submit myself to God, then your faith does that very same thing for it like that. Is there anybody here in the prayer line or outside that never see it operated? Let's see your hands. Never did see it operated. Just about two or three. Well, I don't know if the Lord may be I'll try to, maybe a one or two, if the Lord will permit, they get anointing, you know, we'll pray for this handkerchief. Then maybe Brother Moore can walk the back and we'll get some and let the people come to Now, if, uh, if each one of you coming, if you believe with all your heart and with all your soul, now what does it take? The Bible says, These signs shall follow them that believe. Is that right? If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. How many know that that was the last word that Jesus Christ said on this earth? St. Mark 16. The last word that ever fell from the lips of Jesus Christ said, If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. My ministry has never been too effective in America. But oh, how it goes overseas. Brother Moore was telling us that he's the brother ran as hard as you preached this week. If that would be anywhere outside the United States, there'd be a uh, hundred or two hundred thousand souls run to Christ. Right? Now you see what a documented condition we're in here. Oh. My. It's becoming to a mass Corinthianism, right? Just everything, this is us, and we this, and we won't have them do this and this, that. Step out and take the word. Believe God. Poor little America. Feel sorry for him. But the hour is at hand. God can't judge a just people. They pass from judgment. But it has to get in this fix so he can stand his judgment. You just remember, we are in for it. Just keep that on your books and see how long it's going to be. Now, if the mighty works would have been done in Africa that's been done in Arizona, they'd have repented long ago. If the mighty works has been done in Arizona had been done in Germany where I had no war then repented long ago in Germany I made my order call five nights and got 10,000 each night or, and but 50,000 souls won to Christ in five nights and never touched a person 
They would just pile up and heap up and everything of crutches, wheelchairs, just pile them in corners and everything. Brother Julius Stutzcliffe is somewhere in the building tonight. I seen him a while ago setting a chaplain Stutzcliffe. He was with me in South Africa on Durban where many thousands of people to a big racetrack and we were only there about three or four days, something like that. And they were still coming to the meeting a week after I was gone. And the uh, order call was made of the line to call. We couldn't give out prayer cards. We just let the missionaries go out and take two out of this tribe and two out of this tribe and two out of that tribe. There's about 15 tribes there. And they lined up a little prayer line. And the first one coming to the platform was a Mohammedan woman. And that woman went, I said, why did you come to me as a Christian if you're a Mohammed? The interpreter said, said, well, she believed that I could help her. I said, why didn't you go to your priest? Well, she believed I could help her. I said, have you ever read the Bible? Yes. And if Jesus will return and do the same things that he did when he was here, and let me know who you are, what's happening, and so forth, and what you're here for, would you believe it and accept Jesus? She raised her hand, she would. And the Holy Spirit come down said, you went with your husband. He's a long, heavy set man with a black mustache. You went to, to uh, she was an Indian, went to the doctor the other day, and he examined you in the female glands and said you had a cyst that should be operated on. She said, that's right, and she said to the Lord Jesus. That shook the Muhammad to 10,000 came to Christ at one time. And I met a missionary who was saying the precious jewel, the precious jewel, he had been there 30 years preaching, and have won one Mohammed. Brother, the Mohammeds, them Hindus came from the old Medes and Persians. They all turn out. <laughs> That's right. But the real, genuine Lord Jesus in action at one time, well, and when I made the altar call that afternoon, which I believe, and Brother Julius, I believe you believe the same, way over what we said, but 30,000 came to Christ at one time. One altar call. And F. F. Bosworth, and if anybody ever met a saint in this modern day, it's F. F. Bosworth. Yes, sir, I'd stand with that if I was dying this minute. And that old man stood there looking over that ground and weeping, and was estimated 25,000 miraculous healings taking place, and never touched a person who stood there and prayed for him. Seven truckloads of, air, of all kinds of sticks and stretchers and things that sticked up off the ground. Well, they were all flat away from it. Twenty-five thousand. Think of it. And here you can preach that you tap your life out. Someone said, well, pretty good enough. Oh, I don't care to go back anymore. Is that America for you? Oh, your day has come. I'm not talking to the church. Your day is at hand, too. That's the rapture. <laughs> Praise be to God. Brother Stutzkamp, wasn't that a wonderful meeting? Would you just stand up a minute? Here's the author of the book, A Prophet Visits Africa, Chaplain Jesus Stutzkamp. The captain of the United States Army now. He was trained, I believe, at Wheaton or somewhere there, and the same college and so forth that Billy Graham come from. Went right along with me, writing that book and taking those pictures. He was standing there that night when that, I saw that bus coming in the first night when I landed there in Africa. And there was that bus moving in there. I saw that bar of one leg six inches short or another. Chaplain Stats paper standing right there taking that note when he had. When I looked around, I seen a little green car fly sideways and hit into a tree and broke the back of a young girl, and I couldn't find her while she was laying way down under here. And when I walked, I never, they be careful what you tell her. But I saw a vision of her rejoicing and running. I said, stand up on your feet, young lady. Jesus Christ makes you well. Her mother said, oh, no, no, she can't stand. If the doctor says that she moves, she'd die. Her back was snapping together. And the girl sprang to her feet rejoicing, and the mother fell in the cup. The girl came out of it. Right. Brother Stats came out the pictures of it from the book. Yeah. That settled it. 
thousands, thousands, thousands swarms of Christ. But we try to study it out. I'm, I'm not talking about the church in America. Look at here tonight. How many in here saved? Let's see your hands. Every Christian in here. See? Sinners are not interested, are they? They don't want to come. No care about it. Just about to send away the day of grace. I've seen in 33 how cars that look before the coming of the Lord. They're putting you in that shape. You remember, I prophesied this. You mark it in your books. I've told you many times, every time here. There will come a time. America is a woman's nation. And a woman will rise up soon in America and become a great person, like a president or somewhere, before the coming of the Lord, I believe. Just remember that. And I've said that. And cars will become more like an age shape just before the total annihilation or the destruction comes to this nation. Let us pray. Now, Heavenly Father, here we are. We're on the threshold of a, of a new event. Here's many standing here sick and afflicted to come through the line. Behold your servant, Lord. Here's handkerchiefs laying here, packages, letters. They're going to the needy. I bless these handkerchiefs in Christ's name, and may everyone be healed. Grant it, Lord. I pray that this blessing will be received by everyone. And as American, as a servant of God in this nation, and this is people, I bless this people in Christ's name. Oh, God, I pray that you bless every minister. And oh, may we get a new vision of lost souls and scream as loud as we can for the end of the hand. Grant it, Lord, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to try something just now. And I want you brothers to watch, because when I get under, if the anointing would come. I'd like to pray for all these people as a promise, but I'd like to pray for them so you could get them moving first, so that the whole group could be prayed for. But I'd like to first feel the touch of, I can't help it, friends. You may think I'm a fanatic. But I know that in myself, there, I haven't got nothing here. I'm just a man. And I, I want to feel that something and know that anointing is here. Before I lay hands on these people, though I can't stop with them. All I can do, you can't do it. But I just like to feel the anointing for the first three or four or five people or something. Then you brothers just watch. Would that be satisfaction with the whole of the crowd? And how many of those going to join with me and pray with me now? Up in the balcony. See, all you people look up there. There's at least a thousand people here tonight. I've judged that many anyhow. I'm a poor judge. But I say there's a thousand people here. There will be a thousand prayers going for you at once. All the children of God. Look at what kind of people. Every one of you is born again. Raise your hand. See what? God's got to hear it. I said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be in their midst. He's here. Now, a little vindication of that. May the Lord God of heaven grant it. For the glory of God. The more you stand there, and as the three or four passes through, you see it just gets a touch of weakness, and you start the line coming. Now, ladies, you're standing here for something. I don't know. He does. You know, I don't know nothing about you and don't know what you're here for. But what are you, it says, what are you trying to do, Brother Brandon? I'm yielding myself. Just, did the Bible say in one place, behold the lilies of the field? That's in the Bible. What does a lily do? He toils all day and night just to yield itself to the bee and the passerby, to give out. He has made a lily. God makes honey. So he makes the lily to give out the honey. He gives gifts in his church. We just yield ourselves. And he yields. Now, if God will permit me to know what you want to ask God for, just a moment, would you believe with all your heart? Now, you know that I don't know what you're praying about now. I, I couldn't tell you. But if you ask God something, and he'll tell me what you want, would you believe 
Will the audience believe that? Now, this is for you, children. Now, each one believe it. While you're out there, believe yourself. That's just the time for the lady. The lady is wants to be prayed for for a heart condition. It's a drop piece. You believe that he'll make you well of it? Heal you? Give you what? Aren't you a minister's one? I thought so. I believe I know your husband. All right? Come here just a moment. Our blessed Heavenly Father, we bless this woman in Christ's name that she will receive her healing for the glory of God. Amen. And God bless you, baby. Now to you, lady, do you believe with all your heart? The Bible said, if thou canst believe, all things are possible. Your troubles in your throat. And that's called an ulcer of the throat. And it's got, uh, it's caused something in the gland. And it's affecting your ears. That's right, isn't it? Now you believe? Come here. Oh, blessed Jesus, I pray that you'll heal her in the name of Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. How do you do you believe with all your heart? God can take the cataract away. I can't see it, but you got a cataract. And you're believing God for it. You believe me to be God's prophet. You're not from here. No, sir. Your wife's with you. And she's already accepted her healing. And you're from a high. Right? Your name's Weber. That's right. I hurry back and get well. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. How do you do? You believe? Young man, I don't know you. I've never seen you, but there's a dark shadow over you. The doctor has condemned you to die. That is, he said you had a tumor in your head. He gives you six months to live. Won't you surrender now and all your habits and everything with it? Will you do it? Surrender to Christ, quit smoking everything else and give your life to Christ. Will you do it? I condemn this devil on the basis of the shed blood of Jesus Christ that it will leave this fire. And then the report we lost from the leukemia child. May this young man live and be well in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you, young fellow. All right. God bless this man in healing in the name of Jesus Christ. God bless our brother and heal him in Jesus Christ's name. Heavenly Father, bless our sister to heal her in Christ's name. Bless this little boy, Lord, and heal him in Jesus Christ's name. God bless this man and heal him in Jesus Christ's name. God bless this young man and heal him in Jesus Christ's name. God bless this lady and heal her in Jesus Christ's name. God bless this little lady and heal her in Jesus Christ's name. God bless this lady to heal her in Jesus Christ's name. God bless this girl and heal her in Jesus Christ's name. God bless this man and heal him in Jesus Christ's name. God bless our brother and heal him in Jesus Christ's name. Just a moment. Are you praying, audience? Be in prayer now. There's visions over the audience, even. 
Oh, my. It's so hard to run this kind of line. Pray for me. You pray for me, too. Keep praying now. Just keep praying. Oh, Lord, it bless this person in Jesus' name. Lord bless our sisters. Lord bless our sisters. Lord bless this woman. Lord bless this dear woman in Jesus' name. Lord bless this dear woman in Jesus' name. God bless this Indian sister in the name of Jesus, I pray. God bless this young lady in the name of Jesus, I pray. God bless this lady in the name of Jesus, I pray. God bless our sisters in Jesus Christ's name. God bless our brother in Jesus Christ's name. God bless our sisters in Jesus Christ's name. God bless this our brother in Jesus Christ's name. God bless this little boy in Jesus Christ's name. God bless this lady in Jesus Christ's name. The Lord bless our brother in Jesus Christ's name. God bless this lady in Jesus Christ's name. God bless our sister in Jesus Christ's name. God bless our brother in Jesus Christ's name. God bless our sister in Jesus' name. God bless this brother in Jesus Christ's name. Now while we're waiting a minute, how many of the audience has been prayed for Please you accept your healing? Now, you wanted hands laid on you. I want to see if you believe it now. Lay your hand, uh, raise your hands up. You just come through the prayer line. Please, you've been healed. Thank the Lord. That's good. I may be altogether wrong. Uh, it may be in America we're supposed to do it this way. I don't know. All right. Have faith now. Keep praying. All the audience, keep praying. Everybody pray. I'm just closing my eyes and laying hands on the seat. God bless my in Jesus' name. God bless our dear sister in Jesus' name. God bless my brother in the name of Jesus. God bless our sister in the name of Jesus. God bless the brother in the name of Jesus Christ. God bless our sister in the name of Jesus Christ. God bless this child in Jesus' name. God bless Sister Wara in Jesus' name. Just a moment while we're standing here. This woman here died in the prayer line when I was here the first time. Mrs. Hattie Waldo. Her husband is a plumber. Been a bosom friend. And the woman had cancer. And she wanted to come in here. I wish she lived or died. And in the prayer line, somebody told me that someone was dying. And the Lord healed that woman. That's been about 10 years ago, Sister Waldo. And I was 10 years last Monday. She knows the very day and time. And she, one night, I believe I was up in Canada, way up in Saskatchewan, Brother Stockman, and they called me to pray for her little grandson, I believe it was, Grand, sister, grandson, what was going on? brain hemorrhage and polio in the St. Joseph's Hospital and prayed for him on the, by the phone and the Lord healed that little boy perfectly normal and well. He was in the house and we eat with our sister over there one night. But that night, Sister Waldo, God bless your heart. God bless you, sister. Let's say praise the Lord. Amen. Hey. Amen. How great thou art, how great thou art. Oh, I wish I could sing that. How great thou art. Isn't he wonderful? Now, everybody bow your head and pray. All right? Dear God, I pray for this lovely little child that you'll heal her and make her well in Christ's name. God bless this, our sister. And by laying on of hands, God has said in our words, These signs shall follow them that believe. If they lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. This I do in Jesus' name. Likewise to our sister, I lay my hands in Jesus' name. 
Like manner to our sister in Jesus' name, may she be healed. Like manner to our brother in Jesus' name, may he be healed. In like manner to our sister in Jesus Christ's name, may she be healed. In Jesus Christ's name, may our sister be healed. In Jesus Christ's name, may our brother be healed. In the name of Jesus Christ, may the baby be healed. Bless our sister and heal her in Jesus' name. Bless our dear sister and heal her with hands laid up on her in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I say, friends, if God speaks anything, he tells the truth. These signs shall follow them that believe. Be in prayer and I should hear them. Heavenly Father, in Jesus Christ's name, may our brother be healed. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, may our sister be healed. Amen. That's so much easier than the other way for me. If that's the way you desire it, that's sure my way too. But now look, what have we done? We've laid hands on the sick and prayed for them. Is that right? How many believe that went through the prayer line should heal? Let's see your hands. Everyone went through the prayer line. Praise the Lord. You know, that may be the right way. All right. Is there any persons in here now that's sick that hasn't been in the prayer line? Let's see your hands. All right. It's like to be about 100 or more. All right. Now just keep your hands up. I'm going to raise my hands up. What are we doing? We're trying to touch somebody. Who is it? The one who stands. I'm in a presence. Who knows us? If you're reaching your hands, I'm reaching my hands. And we're all reaching our hands. Oh, God, be merciful. One day, when Moses' hands was lifted up, the battle went favorable. And oh, God, today we are lifting our hands, believing that our faith is lifted up to Jesus Christ, who was lifted up for us. And we believe your healing power. Oh, God, let it rain from the skies like a shower upon every individual here and heal them. Grant it, Lord, make some healing power. Call in this building just now. Everyone that believes that you're healed, clap your hands together. <laughs> Hallelujah. Then it's over. Then we're healed. Then Christ is here. Then God is here. Then the angels are here. Then God gets glory out of all. Praise be to the Lord God. All right. Brother Moore. While we bow our heads, just a moment. I'll ask Brother Moore to come and take the service today. You want to pray for us, God, pray that you will bless this man and heal him. In Jesus Christ's name. Amen. God bless you. Now we'll bow our heads, just a moment. Brother Moore. Thank you.